Thank you for tuning in. I am Megan Jones and I am your host here for Raw Artists Industry Exchange. Um, of course, this is your live stream straight from my uh, apartment in, in Los Angeles, California. So um, this week we are talking all things law. Um, today I'm excited to introduce Seema um, Tillock. I am apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name. We didn't get to have this conversation prior. Um, so um, apologies for that. But she is an intellectual property, media, entertainment, and business attorney. So really excited to chat with her. Of course, you can find out more by following her. I pinned her Instagram account, uh, create underscore LLP. So you can follow her on Instagram. And of course, going to create LLP um, dot com. Let us get Seema in here, though, get her in on the action with them about all things law. Um, so amazing. Um, hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Apologies if I'm, can you pronounce no, you your did last a, name? you did a great job. Okay. <laughs> I was like, we didn't get, normally, you know, we get to see each other face to face and I get to work that out beforehand. But, um, you know, we just got to roll with them um, with what we've got going on. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, good to see you um, in the, in the flesh here so to speak. Um, but I'm really curious for our audience to learn a little bit more about you. So tell us about yourself. What, who is Seema? <laughs> sure. So my name is Seema. Um, I am a co-founder and partner at the law firm Create LLP, which I launched with my friend and business partner, Ted, last year. It's been like about a year to the day, which is Incredible Happy anniversary! Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I guess to get to this place, I started out my legal career doing intellectual property litigation um, and entertainment litigation where I was representing talent and artists in disputes against media companies um, when their images had been used without their permission, their trademarks, um, invasion of privacy cases, um, and a lot of defamation. So okay. when journalists report stories that might be a little scandalous, you have to be really careful. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. So I was, I was um, doing that on the litigation side for a few years, um, but realized I wanted to move over to the transactional side. So working more with creatives and production companies to create products and um, to tell, help them tell their stories. So taking everything I learned from my litigation background on how to avoid risk to translate it into where I was at was um, I was working in the independent film space for a while. Okay. Um, so I would do agreements between directors, producers, artists, production companies, um, distribution deals for like films that go on to Hulu or Netflix, yeah. um, things like that. And last year, um, my business partner and I just had this vision that aligned and we decided to go out on our own. And now we're representing not only filmmakers, but artists, influencers, graphic designers, sculptors, and it's been a whirlwind, but really fun. Yeah. So you decided to have this business baby together. That's amazing. I love mm -hmm. that. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, in real life, I'm a publicist, so I th that part about journalists really spoke to me. Yes. Uh, having to having to deal with that and kind of combat that um, that sort of thing is definitely very interesting. So, when it comes to you know freelancers, I I assume there's some nuances sort of regarding the ownership of content, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do creatives always keep the ownership of the content, or like? you know, even like, even when they're helping create a brand, how does that work? Um, that's a really good question. And that's one of the like biggest things you need to decide before you mm -hmm. enter into an agreement as a creative with the company. Okay. Um, so if a brand is commissioning your work, so say you're a graphic designer and you're creating images for a video game company, mm -hmm. but those images are solely for the video game company, that company is probably going to want you to enter into a full buyout of all the rights in a work for hire relationship, okay. which means that they hired you to create this product. Mm -hmm. So they're going to own everything. Mm -hmm. That's also pretty standard in like, um, in film agreement or in film agreements in writing agreements. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the work, work for hire, um, mm -hmm. language. Yeah. And that also like, it scares a lot of people because 
it, like in some ways, some people construe that to, um, to deem like an employment relationship between the company and the creative. Mm. Um, and a way to get over that is instead of doing a full work for hire, um, full buyout of rights, you can do an assignment of certain okay. rights. Um, so you can do either all rights and then you would, you would, it would be more like a license as opposed to like a, a full ownership of copyright to the company. Okay. Um, and in that way you, you keep the ownership and you can perhaps even license out that content to other companies. Mm. Um, it all just comes down to the deal. And then on the flip side of that, if you're a photographer and you're taking pictures that you then want to sell, mm -hmm. um, but it's not really commissioned for a particular company, um, or if you create music, right, and it's not commissioned for someone in particular, mm -hmm. you can license the rights to that content um, in a more limited way where you keep the ownership and you can say, okay, this is exclusive to you for a period of time, mm -hmm. but after that period of time, I can then license this to other companies. Okay. Or, you know, there, so you, you want to consider the length of time you want the license to be in place for. Yeah. The, the exclusivity over it. Some companies will say, no, this is like, this is our content. We want to own it. Right. Yeah. Um, and then you also want to consider the media. So is it going on social? Is it going on print? Is right. it going on billboards? Like what, what exactly are you creating the services for? Right. Um, so I think with those three things, so like, the length of time, the media, exclusivity, and ownership, those are like, those are the four most important things to consider in these creative agreements. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you kind of like don't think, or the lay person, uh, you know, wouldn't necessarily think about that, right? That especially mm -hmm. you mentioned, you mentioned video games, right? And they're like, oh yeah, like video game is just going to go in the game, but you don't think about no, they're creating so many other things to promote mm -hmm. that game that your work is going on to. So that's definitely something to take into consideration. And I'll give you an example. Um, yeah. One of my clients wrote an article for a big publication mm -hmm. and that publication said that they had all derivative rights. So mm -hmm. if, if that article was turned into a film, my client wouldn't have any rights to that, that work, but, the film is based on her article. Yeah. So you enter into this weird situation where you're like, well, I should actually get some of the proceeds from the film. So you just want to consider like what you're actually giving up, mm. which is why, and I know there's like a lot of legal language and jargon that's hard yeah. to understand. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's so important to hire a lawyer early mm. to help you sift through it rather than like dealing with it down the line when you've already missed out. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So I'm, um, do you recommend kind of like, um, like you're, you're mentioning early on in the process, like if I'm an artist and I have, you know, a deal that's presented to me, is it, you know, do you just want to run that by a lawyer like right away or? Yeah, like I mean, I would, I would, I would run it by a lawyer pretty soon in the process. I know sometimes you want to negotiate terms, right? but if you're, if you're fairly new to the process, you don't always know what terms you're negotiating. Yeah. So you could, you could be giving up like a lot of compensation if you don't understand the nuances mm -hmm. and you can leverage certain aspects of the deal. So, I mean, my goal as a lawyer is to help my clients understand how these deals work. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes I'll work, um, really closely with the client to create like a template that they can just use moving forward um, so that they understand the deals they're getting into. Yeah. Because as creatives, I know we do like a lot of emails, like, yeah. the, like the terms are in the email and that's <laughs> fine. But, you know, I feel like if you had a set of standard terms, that helps. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had um, another lawyer um, on earlier this week. Um, yeah, he was great. Tristan, yeah, I think he might be on now. Hi, Tristan, if not. Um, but he, you know, made that point of, of um, you know, saying, yeah, an email can be considered, you know, uh, sort of like contractually obligated, but like, let's lay this all out, right? Like, let's, right. 
let's have it. So, um, hi, um, we got some <laughs> questions here. Somebody asked, um, what kind of fees should be expected for a lawyer to review things like that? That always seems to be unclear. Is there? It, it really varies. Like some okay. lawyers will do flat fees. Okay. Um, a lot of lawyers will do hourly rates. So it depends on like the, the expertise of the lawyer. Um, if you're working with someone who has more experience, their rate may be higher, but then they're pro probably working on your document for like 30 minutes versus right. someone who's fresh out of law school spending like three hours with lower rates. Yeah. So it, it could vary anywhere between like, I mean, I've seen like 150 to $700 an hour. Yeah. Um, it, I think like for, for me, when I'm assessing fees, I, I look at what the type of agreement is, mm -hmm. um, how much time it's going to take, if there's like a lot of negotiating between my client and the other side, um, mm -hmm. I, I sort of factor that all in. But um, because I'm, I'm like, it's a firm of me and my partner, we're pretty yeah. flexible. Yeah. Um, and we're here to support the community. And I think a lot of a lot of lawyers in my position are. Yeah. Um, so it might seem like a it's like a couple hundred dollars up front, but it, right. it saves you some trouble down the line. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's something um, <laughs> that we kind of brought up that I think is, you know, again you're sometimes you're so focused on the now and the short term that you think you kind of forget about long term right mm -hmm. i think that that's important also when considering making this investment um and yeah it's it's really gonna kind of depend on the expertise that right you know, so um so that's good to know um another question here what about music when it comes to owning your masters Oh, music is like, music is so convoluted. So there's master rights, <laughs> think rights. Um, if you own your masters, I mean, there's, there's a limited amount of things you can do with just the master rights. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I don't see the question, but are you owning your sync rights also? Carolina, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, I have to give the legal answer is in that it depends. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can you can email me and we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you guys uh, again, I pinned a uh, free LLP there. Definitely follow um, and hit Sima up if you have particular questions. Because yeah, I mean, I think you're right. There's so many variances and like so mm -hmm. many. He just decides to call. Um, yeah, I think it just sort of depends in that you're you're absolutely right. Um, so yeah, hit Seema up, ask some questions. Um, we definitely want to um, we definitely want to know that. Um, oh, she's just dealing with some stuff with producers currently uh, between masters publishing and songwriting is a oh, mess. No, it sounds like it's it's a mess. She says so. Let's talk. yeah yeah <laughs> let's let's my, Carolina, my let's email address is on our website. Chat. Absolutely. Um, so cool. Well, for those that, that are just tuning in, um, first off, thank you for tuning in. <laughs> um, second, we are talking with Seema Tillich. She is intellectual property, media entertainment, business attorney. She's doing all the things. She's wearing all the hats, you guys. Um, so if you have any for if any, any more questions, definitely post them below. We're trying to get to them as soon as possible. So Obviously, you know, the majority of our audience um, are creatives of some sort, right? We've got artists, musicians, designers, performers. I heard you repping sculptors. I'm sure we've got some of those out there as well. Um, and all of these artists are and creators are creating their own brands. So what are some of the steps like every creative should take to protect their brand? Oh, good question. Um... I think to, to, to protect your brand, you need to properly establish your brand first. Mm. Um, so, you know, if, if you're creating a brand name, you want it to be unique. Mm -hmm. um, if you're selling shoes, you don't want to call yourself Nike. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think it's really important to see what else is out there and to do your research before you like set out and become like this famous musician called Lady Gaga to find there's another Lady Gaga. So what I would recommend is um, first do your research. You can either work with a trademark attorney. Um, my firm does that. Or you can even just order a clearance report from oh. there's like there's several companies that do clearance searches. Yeah. So you can just like send them the brand name you're thinking about. Um, they can do like a state federal trademark database search and they would you would basically get a report of all of the brands that are similar to yours. Mm -hmm. Um, and that helps you like for, differentiate yourself from the very get go. 
Hmm. Um, another thing you can do to protect your brand is trademarking the brand name or your logo. Um, that just gives you the bona fide proof that you are the person who can use this trademark in connection with whatever services or goods you're providing within the United States. Okay. So though, like, I think uh, like trademark protection is great. I think learning what else is out there is great and doing your research. Um, and then, you know, to the extent any of that material or your brand name is ripped off or infringed by someone, you could send a cease and desist letter to them saying, I'm the rightful owner to this. Please stop. Yeah. Um, you could do that yourself. Like anyone watching can do it themselves or they can have an attorney help with that, which, yeah. which adds um, more of an oomph to the yeah. claim. <laughs> you like, ooh, I just got a letter from a lawyer. Yeah. I don't know about that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's interesting, you know, cause it's like, I guess at a, a base level, it's like, oh, you would think just that just like, oh, maybe if I just, well, I Googled it and like, I didn't see anybody else have this name, but which, you know, could be the case, but also that, that report that you're talking about pulling, I think at a base level, if you are like super serious, that mm -hmm. is something that you should definitely do. That's not to me. That sounds like smart. Right. Or, and like, like run a Google search also, yeah. you know, do, yeah. do a little more digging than something very basic. Yeah. 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 Google. I mean, just Google's our friend right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so is there anything that artists, I guess, should consider before like all of this aside, um, before posting their creative work on social media? Um, you know, I think we, we all want to use social media to share our work. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Yeah. Um, but what I will say is if, if you're like launching a product mm. um, or even really particular artwork, um, I would want to make sure that you're securing the proper intellectual property in that and making sure you have ownership to that IP before you send it off to the public. Mm. Um, for example, one of our clients um, wanted to sell some merchandise and had a really unique, fun name that he wanted to use to sell it. Mm -hmm. And so he created the product. He's an artist, so it was beautifully crafted. I can't tell you what it is, just for confidentiality. Yeah. Reasons, <laughs> but it was beautifully crafted. It had like this beautiful logo on it, but he never secured the trademark. Even though he wanted to, he was just putting it off. Yeah. Um, and a company, I think it was either in China or in, in Europe. I think it was China. Um, some some company in China filed for a trademark in the U.S. with that same name and started manufacturing and selling the same products. And that was a huge issue because even though our client was was technically selling these or not selling, but made these products before the other company did yeah he didn't register the trademark yeah um so he lost his ownership to it and he didn't have he didn't have the resources to pay for a legal dispute yeah to claim ownership to those rights what so he yeah so he kind of just lost out so if you are launching something like that yeah or so, like some sort of movement that can have a big impact i would recommend trademarking any brand names if there's any artwork, you can copyright the image. Okay. Um, so there's there's various there's various tools to protect your rights there. Yeah, um, we're getting a couple of questions here. Mm. For, um, is self branding better than labeled branding? And how strong are poor man copyrights? Ooh, okay. Um, self branding versus labeled branding. I'm not sure I know the difference between the two. Um, if you want to expand, I can answer the next question. Hmm. Um, poor man copyrights, I think they're referring to um, not having a federally protected copyright. Mm -hmm. So anytime you create, you write an article or you take a photo, mm -hmm. you, you automatically have a copyright in into that product because mm -hmm. you've created it, so you own it. Right. Um, but you can go the next step and federally protect that copyright by registering whatever you created with the copyright office. Mm. And that tells the entire world that you're the owner of that material. Mm. Um, if you do that, you have, you have claimed to more damages than you would if you didn't register the copyright. Okay. So you, you, still have, you still have an interest in ownership in the copyright if you don't protect it, but 
in order to get more out of your IP, mm -hmm. um, you want to protect it. It's kind of like talking about the email contract versus an actual contract, right? Right. Like, you could probably battle it out in court, perhaps, but like, no, nah, this contract is is like, it's pretty mm -hmm. clear. Um, I'm I'm curious the where you can the copyright you mentioned is that is there like a a fee to every time to copyright or is yeah so there's I, okay. I think the application fee is like fifty five dollars oh okay um the the application is pretty simple unless you're like registering a copyright in a film or a collective mm -hmm. work with uh, where other people have been involved yeah um but it's fairly simple um and the fee is not exorbitant. Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's because like the, the bitter truth is that there are so many companies out there that, you know, are taking advantage of artists work or, you know, even their ideas. Um, you know, what should one do if they discover a person or a business is using their work without their permission? Um, well, I would immediately send that cease and desist letter. Um, you could either do that through an attorney or yourself. Again, an attorney would be a stronger would have a stronger push yeah <laughs> um or if it's if it's like an image um or something that you've written you can and you see that that's posted on a website for mm -hmm. sale for example mm -hmm. you can contact the website and do what's called a dmca notice okay which which says that you are the rightful owner of the copyright Mm -hmm. um, you did not authorize anyone else to exploit the content or to use the content. Mm. Um, so take it down. Yeah. And websites are uh, really quick to act in those situations um, because the copyright laws are very stringent mm. and they can be held liable if they don't do anything in some capacity. So a DMCA complaint is the quickest way to get information taken down. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I used to... I used to work in um, uh, taking down like intimate photos of people gone viral. Ooh. And the quickest way to get that taken down was through a copyright dispute. Oh. Um, oftentimes though, you'll need to register the copyright. Okay. So, so yeah. There's like, there's the Back little, the... yeah, the caveat. So yeah. um, sometimes like you, you might be able to get away with it, but yeah, you, you would have to in some instances. So in, in this, you know, if, if no one, if they hadn't taken precautions in the first, first place to kind of like safeguard their work, mm -hmm. what grounds do they have for, for legal pursuit? You still have some grounds. Um, mm -hmm. The damages would just be lessened if you didn't really okay. protect anything. Okay. Um, you have common law copyright and trademark rights to anything you create or to your logo and brand. Mm -hmm. um, so you have some grounds. Um, but again, you're, you're not seeing the same amount of damages. Right. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. By damages, we're talking about <laughs> yeah. money. That, well, that, come, that come well after a lawsuit where a lot of money has to go in. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, um, Carol Carolina, she's got another question here. Do you recommend registering every song through copyright.gov? even if your songs are already technically copywritten once it's created in, in a tangible, tangible medium? Um, again, I'm sorry to do this to you, but it depends. Okay. Um, it depends on if you're seeking distribution of that music. Okay. Sometimes the distributors will require that you have copyright um, to each of those songs. But a lot of times with, with music, if it's a song that's, compo that's composed within like an album, Mm -hmm. um, you can just do one application. So it's like $55 for that whole set. Okay. Versus $55 per copy Right. Per like song. if you're just, if you're just releasing like one song at a time, maybe it might be best to register those songs. But if you're putting out an album, you're saying you can, that can be housed under one copyright. Correct. Okay, cool. Amazing. I love that. Yeah. Um, we man we're just like flying through these things thank you guys for your questions really appreciate that i love when our audience is um like here for what we have to say <laughs> um so i really appreciate you coming on today Seema, and sharing your knowledge with us is there anything that you kind of want to leave with our you know a personal message you want to leave with our creative community right now sure um 
I, I mean, we all know this is a crazy time that none of us have ever experienced before. No. Yeah. Um, and it's not just hard on large businesses. It's really hard for the creative community. Definitely. Um, I think right now is an excellent time to do development work, mm. to set up collaborations. Um, I think every, like most people I've reached out to are willing to have a conversation because mm -hmm. we're all like sitting at home. Um, we, we like, we have time, but we don't. Yeah. Um, some of my friends uh, flaked on a FaceTime video call the other day. So still happens on video. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I think, I think you should try to set up collaborations, figure out how to develop, um, your like the next pro project right yeah. and also um maybe get your your legal the legal side of your business in order right yeah. um yeah, sure. it it's important to like set up some companies like a company to protect your assets sometimes um figuring out your branding is really important your logos your ip um yeah and i, I think i think there's a lot of we have a lot of time to do good work right now yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, um, you know, Google's your friend. So um, create a list of, you know, checks and balances that you need to make um, and kind of one at a time um, kind of go through them. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, you're talking about collaboration. And of course, you know, that made me think like, oh, does one probably need a contract when they're dealing with another artist to work on, you know, a project mm -hmm. that they collaborate on? Um, so that brings up another sort of like, you know, uh, interesting aspect there as well. You need to protect yourself even if, when it's like working with another artist. Right. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, well, that's amazing. So create um, LLP right, is where they can go. That's the website. I've pinned at create underscore LLP. You guys go follow SEMA. Um, Carolina, thank you so much for your questions and everybody else that, uh, that asked questions. Um, feel free to connect with SEMA offline or online, whichever way we're <laughs> off of Instagram live <laughs> and in her uh, DMs or in her inbox. Um, she has all of the information where you can learn more about how to protect yourself as an artist. Um, and like Simu was saying, like, now is the time to do it, um, to, you know, just everything has kind of stopped and changed as we know it. So why not set yourself up for, for success when, you know, you know, before you didn't like, quote unquote, have the time, we've got the time now. Right. So Amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Seema, for, for connecting with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me. It was really fun. Yeah, it was definitely fun. Um, well, have a great day. I hope your friends don't flake on you the next um, <laughs> FaceTime date. I'm coming after them. That's, not, my that's not good. That's not good. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Um, amazing. Yay. Another successful industry exchange. Um, you guys, I really appreciate you tuning in and you guys asking these questions. Um, I love my raw artist community. Um, you know, I have been in some form or fashion with the organization for a decade now. And, um, you know, I am a creative myself. I love working with creatives. And I think it's really important that we create this really great group and really great network of support because we all need support, especially right now, um, you know, whether that's um, advice, resources, tools, um, or just, man, someone to commiserate with, right? Because we all know the artist plight. We all know what we're going through right now. So I think that's really important. So I'm Megan Jones. I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, we love you guys. We want you to be healthy and happy and of course, forever creating. Um, stay tuned at Raw Artist though. We're gonna have some really great, amazing content coming your way um, and looking forward to bringing you more information uh, on our platform and of course here on Industry Exchange. Hi, Alexis Rose. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, yeah, have a great day.